the very first interview I did with Paul O'Sullivan was on national radio uh, at our offices at Melrose Arch. I don't know if you remember it, Paul, but you said to me, no, I can't tell you beforehand when I'm coming into the studio because there are people who would rather that I was not on earth. Now, he'll tell you how many bullets he's still got in his body or how many times he's been shot, but I know it's a few times. We, we had to do that. We used to always preview who was coming onto the radio show that evening. But in this particular evening, when Paul came on, we weren't able to preview who was, who was coming along. And it's been like that ever since. He is the most courageous man I have ever met. Uh, I've had a lot to do with him over the years, both here and in London. The, the real story about the implosion of the Zuptas uh, isn't what you read in the media. Yes, sure, Gupta Leaks was a big part of it. But there was an enormous amount of work that was done by Paul and his friend, Lord Peter Hayne, in London, and the Secret Service in the UK as well. It's an untold story and probably a story that you never will hear, but it is one that has reshaped our nation because without international intervention in what was going on here during the worst of the Zuma era, we might still have had, well, we would most definitely still have had Bell Pottinger. And Bell Pottinger and uh, the, the enormity that they were uh, if inflicting the damage they inflicted on this country, you could, you could be sure that that wouldn't have ended. Paul has, has worked in front of the scenes by putting away two commissioners of police, which is unprecedented anywhere in the world. He has worked behind the scenes in doing things that you're not aware of, but the criminals are. And we have him here today on a day that uh, I think the first bit of news that we had from Herman is uplifting. We know we live in a country which is, which is riddled with corruption. However, the tide can and will turn, and when it does, it'll be people like Paul whose efforts will have made it possible. Let's welcome him. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good. I think we still have a lot more challenges in 2021 than we believe are possible. Notwithstanding all of this, um, I choose to live in South Africa. I have an Australian passport, I have an Irish passport, and I have a British passport. I once had an American green card, but I decided not to bother keeping it because there was too much annual paperwork involved. So I choose to live in South Africa. The reason I choose to live in South Africa is very simple. It's the best country in the world. Now, I was in the police for a number of years in South Africa. Um, as Alec pointed out, I was shot a few times on duty. Um, the other people never had to go to court because of it, because I'm also a good shot myself. Uh, so there were nobody that had to be prosecuted for shooting me. Um, and there have been people that have tried to kill me since. And again, you know, nobody had to be prosecuted for that, except Radovan Kretscher. And he's currently awaiting trial amongst all the other crimes he's committed. I think there are three or four cases of conspiring to murder me. And along with him, there are police officials involved. Uh, so Radovan Kretscher wasn't planning to kill me on his own. In fact, he never does anything for himself. He gets other people to do his dirty work and he had police officers who are now languishing in jail with him, awaiting trial for uh, attempting to murder myself. But if I go back to the period when I was in the police, and we start to think about why we should be positive about South Africa, I, I want to cast my mind back to somewhere in the mid-90s. I was in the border police, and I had to go to uh, Bulgaria to bring back a person who'd fled South Africa. He was a Bulgarian, uh, but uh, Bulgaria had decided to uh, send him back to us. I had to go there to collect him. Um, and when I arrived in Sofia, uh, in those days, Olympic Airways were still flying up and down, so I flew to Athens, and then I transferred to Sofia, which is like a 45-minute flight from Athens, and when I got to Sofia, I rented a car from Avis, and I had to drive all the way to Varna, where this person would be handed over to me in custody. And I collected um, 
from the South African Embassy uh, or Consulate or whatever it was in, in Sofia, I collected a local policeman who was a, a plain clothes officer. And the two of us were going in my Avis rental car. Um, and as you probably know, you know, they drive on the wrong side of the road there, although they say it's the right side of the road. And off we go, and they've got this beautiful dual carriageway that goes from Sofia to uh, um, Varna. And the, the speed limit was 90 kilometers an hour. Now, you know, there are parts of South Africa where you can see that the speed limit is set to a certain level for one reason and one reason only, and it's income generating speed limit. So this was an income generating speed limit. And we were cruising along at about 110 or 120, and all of a sudden this guy jumps out of the bushes uh, in uniform, and he's got a white stick with a red circle on the end and holds it up, and I pull over, and of course, I'm sitting on the left-hand side of the car, so he comes to me, and I put the window down, and if he talks to me, this traffic cop in Bulgarian. And then uh, my passenger, uh, when the guy jumps out and we stop, he says, don't let on that I'm a policeman, because I work undercover in anti-corruption, and I don't want this guy to know that I'm a policeman. So the guy comes over, and he tells us we were doing 112 kilometers an hour because this guy is uh, 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 translating for me, and I must pay a 50 lev fine. Now, 50 lev was about, in those days, probably 150 rand. So I had a bundle of levs in my pocket, um, and I peeled out 50 levs, and I gave it to him, and he sort of gave me an informal salute, and he vanished. And I said, well, hang on a minute. Uh, I said, just call him. I need a receipt. So the guy shouts, my Bulgarian police friend shouts to him, uh, what about the receipt? And he says, no, if you want the receipt, the fine is 200 levs. So <laughs> corruption is present everywhere in the world. In some places, it's not as obvious. It goes on all over the world. But I want to just show you some statistics quickly. I'm just going to go with this presentation. Okay, it's very interesting, and these stats, by, by the way, uh, in South Africa, 49.13% of all contact crime. Uh, do we know what, what we mean by contact crime? Contact crime is where the victim of the crime has come face to face or had the opportunity of coming face to face with the perpetrator. Now. For example, a house break-in, even if you're in bed, it's classed as a contact crime because you could come face to face with the perpetrator. An assault is a contact crime. Rape is a contact crime. Robbery is a contact crime. Obviously, murder is a contact crime. Uh, so these are called contact crimes. Now, a detection rate, it means that somebody we know who committed the crime, a detection rate, in South Africa for contact crime is 49.13%, which means more than 50% of all the crimes that take place, which are contact crimes, are not detected. Nobody knows who committed the crime. Or you know who committed the crime, but the police will never get to the bottom of it. Sadly, the conversion rate from 49.13% to prosecution is much, much lower. So even though somebody gets charged, uh, the chances of them actually being prosecuted is quite, uh, quite rare. Now, if we look at the UK, I've put some percentage marks up there. And what I really want to do now is do a show of hands. So we've got different rates there. And we're talking about the detection rate. So put your hand up if you think the detection rate in the UK is 7.8%. Okay? One person. Put your hand up if you think the detection rate is 25.6%. A few more. Put your hand up if you think the detection rate is 70.1%. Okay, now put your hand up if you think the detection rate is 92.2%. Okay, so most of the hands went up, I'd say equally, apart from one hand, were equally spread between 25.6, 70.1, and 92.2%. Uh, two. 
The reality is that in the year ending March 19, the detection rate in the UK on contact crimes was 7.18%. Oh, sorry, 7.8%. And that's been steadily going down since March 15, where the detection rate was 15.5%. That means you can get robbed, assaulted, raped, uh, or a victim of a contact crime in the UK, and in 92.2% of the cases, nobody will be arrested or charged. Quite scary. In fact, you can go into a police station in the UK to report a crime, and actually they take a note, and that's the last you hear of it. So it's not all roses that we think it is everywhere else on the planet. Knife and gun crime in the UK is going up, as you can see. Uh, we're in the year 2019, which is on the right-hand side. And this is now, uh, in the UK, knife and gun crime currently sitting at uh, 40, uh, 43,000 uh, knife and gun crimes a year in, in the UK. Uh, knife crimes particularly nasty. Um, now, the reality of it is that on, a, on an average day, one to two people are stabbed to death in London. Interesting. A lot of uh, stabbings are taking place there. The police in the UK, uh, our police are sometimes, uh, shall we say, overambitious. Uh, they'll go out of their way to deal with crime in some cases, other cases, they will let the crime take place in front of them. The police in the UK are overwhelmed with the increase in contact crime and they can't cope with it. 95% of UK burglaries and robberies are not solved. This, is, this was uh, posted in the Guardian newspaper. Now, of course, we talk about uh, the, the, the year of 2019. Why? Because in 2020, the police in the UK got a bonus. Everybody had to stay at home, and crime went plummeting. So the, the crime stat figures in the UK now are fabulous. You know, it's massive improvements. But we see that as an unnatural um, intervention, if you like. If it carried on the way it was, things wouldn't be that good. Okay, so where we come to over here in South Africa, there are so many things in South Africa that are wrong, but there are so many things that are right. What we have in South Africa is we have a melting pot of humanity. We have 11 national languages, official languages, 11 of them. We have, uh, if you drill down, you know, into the races, okay, let's take the right, the white race. We, in South Africa, we've got Irish. By the way, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. I'm wearing green today uh, because Irish is one of my nationalities. Now, we got Irish, British, Scottish, well, Scottish or British too, I guess. Um, we got uh, French. We got communities of Greeks. We got communities of Italians. We got communities of uh, Jewish people. Uh, is Israelis or Jewish, I don't know, they, they seem to be a nationality and a religion. We got um, uh, Russian, we got Bulgarian, I have uh, some of my best staff are Bulgarian, I've got staff that are Russian. You know, we've got a complete melting pot in South Africa, that's the white. On the black side, we've got people from all over Africa living in South Africa, and for the most part, we all live in harmony. And you walk along the street in London and you sometimes forget and you say good morning to people that are passing you in the opposite direction and they give you a funny look. If you don't say good morning to people in South Africa, you get a funny look. So we are a friendly nation. There are so many positive things about our country. You know, somebody once said, no matter what the problems are, something can be done about it. And the way to start, we formed a charity uh, a number of years ago called Forensics for Justice. Now, 
Unfortunately, I'm not very good at fundraising, so I didn't really raise a lot of money. The most money we raised was when Alec did a little uh, story about, you know, we need some money. And I think in the three weeks following that, we raised about 350,000 rand. But if I tell you, on an average year, we pick up, we collect about between 30 and 40,000 uh, rand. And some of the, the cases that we do, um, we will have one, for example, the Prasa inv uh, investigation. We investigated Lucky Montana, and we opened a criminal docket against him in September 2015. And that investigation took seven months and probably cost somewhere in the region about 1.5 million rand. So I footed the bill for that. And it's necessary in some of these investigations to do that. We investigated Paklani. Paklani was the chief of police. And he had his finger in all these different pies. The, the depth of it hasn't come out yet. He got into an uh, unholy relationship with a police supplier called FDA. Now, FDA never tended for any police work. They set up a company in Australia called FDA Australia or something like that. And they buy all of the goods that they sell to the police. God bless you. They buy all of the goods that they sell to the police from FDA in Australia. And they import them into South Africa. And by doing that, they externalize all the money that they're stealing from you, the taxpayer. So in a period of 10 years, they've done well over a billion rands worth of business. Uh, well over. In fact, I think the figure runs into like two or three billion rand. They would buy items, for example, you know, we all have, or a lot of us do, I, I always carry my camera around with me. Uh, because you never know, you know, these mobile phones are not great cameras. I've always got this with me in case I need to take a picture of something. Now, all the forensic officers in the police are issued with certain uh, items of equipment, which includes things like a Rofin light. Does anybody know what a Rofin light is? Okay, so it's a light that will shine UV, and it will pick up um, body fluid. Uh, so you have a spray, you spray like that, and if there's body fluid there, you shine this light, and you can see body fluid, whether it's blood or any other type of body fluid, you know. So if it's a, if it's a murder scene that's been cleaned up, or you think it's a murder scene that's been cleaned up, and I am a forensic expert, so I actually do know about these things, if it's a murder scene that's been cleaned up and you spray this, uh, we have a special spray that you use, and then you use this Rofin light, you'll be able to see that somebody cleaned up blood from the floor. Okay, it, it, it glows. Now, these Rofin lights cost about uh, a couple of thousand rand each, 2,000 rand, because they have to comply with certain specifications. The same goes with the dust that you put on fingerprints. It has to comply with certain specifications because you're extracting evidence, and the evidence will be used in the court of law. So FDA purchased these Rofin lights from themselves in Australia, and they purchased them at approximately 10 times the price that their Australian subsidiary paid for them, or, or in some of the components that they sold to themselves to sell to the police, the factor was 20 times. So they will buy all these items, multiply by 10 or 20 or whatever, so the company in Australia is making massive amounts of profit, which is just externalizing our taxes. Then the goods come into the country and they sell it to the police. And you get a camera like this. This camera, when I buy it, it's pretty much maintenance free from the time I buy it until I drop it or break it or whatever and then throw it away and buy a new one. The only thing I have to do with this camera is to charge the battery. So. You get a little charger for that, and you plug it in, you put the battery in there, and you charge it. So what they did, they sold, let's, and it's just one example, 30 million rands worth of cameras like this, and they signed a maintenance contract worth uh, 10 million rand a year to maintain these cameras. I've never done any maintenance on mine. I've charged the battery. So they were picking up 10 million rand a year as one example, for maintaining these things. The same with the Rofin lights. They were getting, and the, 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 the amount was something like 100 million rand a year for maintaining these Rofin lights. 
they developed software which is used for tracking of SAP 13 items. Now, SAP 13 is an evidence store. The SAP 13 also holds things which are found. So if, if somebody loses something, like a handbag on a train or something like that, well, in theory, the handbag will be handed in and it will be put into the SAP 13 store. And if after three months nobody's claimed it, it will be disposed of. Evidence, however, is given a serial number. It's kept in the store until the trial comes about. If the trial comes about or the person is acquitted, it goes into a long-term storage for five years, and then it's disposed of. Now, FDI sat with the police and were paid by the police to develop software for the police to run this system. And what they did, despite the fact that you, the taxpayer, paid for it, they retained the intellectual property rights over the software that they were paid to develop. You know, it's like you're hiring an engineer to design a building for you, and when the building's designed, and you've got all your drawings, and it's finished, and you want some more drawings, and the, the, the engineer says, no, 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 but I own that design. You can't have it. But, I mean, the bottom line is, they then reached a point, when I exposed the corruption that was going on, by the way, what they did, they sent money to Namibia, and then they sent the money back from Namibia to a used car dealer in Pretoria. And the used car dealer in Pretoria, all of the Pakani family and others in the police, in the forensics division, were receiving new motor cars. And when they sold the old cars that they had, they sold them back to the same car dealer. So they'd have a car that was worth, say, 300,000 rand, they'd sell it to that car dealer and he would buy it from them for 550,000 rand and they've made an instant profit of two, 250 rand, uh, 250,000 rand and put it in their pocket and then they would buy a new car from the same dealer which was worth, say, 800,000 rand and they'd only pay 300,000 rand for it. So in this way they were doing money laundering. So when all this was exposed... Pakani was arrested and charged, his wife was arrested and charged, and a whole lot of other cops were arrested and charged. And then the people from FDA, they were told, by the way, um, you know, we're not going to pay you any more money, because over the last 10 years, you've stolen about 600 million from the taxpayer. And that was presented to them. And there's lit litigation challenges going on. And then we have a situation like last week where Tina Jamat Peterson, who is very prolific with taxpayer funds. She doesn't work for the money, but she's good at spending it. If she had a way, we, would, we wouldn't have the lights going off because we'd have nuclear power stations all over the country. When the rest of the world is trying to phase out nuclear power, she and Jacob Zuma wanted to go with uh, nuclear power when she was Minister of Energy. Uh, when she was Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, she managed to savage the fisheries industry and put thousands of people out of work. Uh, she handed over defective patrol boats to the fisheries patrol uh, units. Uh, she's really got into a lot of uh, deep dwang. Last week on Wednesday, she gave an instruction at the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee meeting that the police must pay the 540 million rand that FDA are demanding so that the police can take ownership of this software. Of course, the software itself was developed quite a few years ago, so it's actually obsolete anyway. And what's happened is CETA have started developing a new software program, and it's finished, and it's ready to be switched on. It's going to be switched on in a week or two's time, and that cost them a hundred million to develop. So now you have a situation where Tina tells the police they will make peace with FDA and pay them 540 million rand. So we got wind of this. Somebody sent me a tape recording of the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee. So we served them notice, uh, and we served notice to General Sitali, the Chief of Police, who is an honorable man. We are lucky to have a, a dedicated Chief of Police like that. And he informally uh, has... Uh, admitted that they will not be spending one cent with FDA because they are uh, 
They are in the process of being criminally charged, those people, for corruption. So at the end of the day, the, the ship is turning. Um, we have uh, Shamila Batori. Uh, we have Hermione Cronier. We have some really good people in the police. Everyone thinks, you know, the attitude to the police is that they're rubbish. Actually, 90% of the police are hardworking, good people, and we're starting to crack on these cases. Unfortunately, we've lost a decade, so a lot of people that should have been in jail already are not in jail, but their time is coming. And I'm satisfied that the ship is turning and that within another five or ten years, South Africa will be back where it should be, uh, perhaps maybe longer because of COVID-19. But I am absolutely certain that you won't find a better place in the world to live than South Africa. And that's why I say, no matter what you're doing, just put your shoulder to the wheel, uh, find a way of, of helping out where you can. I'm not suggesting you all should now start investigating corruption, but there are outfits around that do it. Forensics for Justice do it. When we get tip-offs, we investigate them. Um, do something, commit yourself to a better South Africa. Not all of you have the ability that I have, where you can pretty much go and live anywhere else in the world. A lot of you are locked in to this country, so let's all work together, black or white, Indian, whatever, let's all work together and make South Africa a great country. It already is a great country, but let's make it better. Thank you very much.